Well, welcome to back class. It's good to have all of you here. We have you here because back pain is a very common condition. We've had a class like this every month for the past four or five years. It's a very common problem. And so what we want to do is we want to be able to meet the needs of all the patients that have back pain. And so we want to start out by giving you some, some basic information that can apply to all of you in a group setting. How many of you work on your car, your own vehicle? One? Okay. When you started working on your car, did you just grab a wrench and start taking things apart? No. Yeah, that's the answer I usually get. Most of the time you have some experience, right? You kind of know what you're doing before you start messing around with the vehicle. Well, we kind of want to use that analogy here. We want to have some sort of a basic understanding of how the back works, what are some common injuries and common tests and treatment approaches that can apply to all of you. Because you're going to learn this tonight and you're going to use that information as you move on to different stages of your, your program. So to start off, to help you understand that you're not alone in this condition, there are, there are many patients that have back pain and it is different for everybody. How many of you have heard of Google? Right? I'm sure this number is a little bit bigger now, but if you go home and you type in low back pain on Google, 67.7 million hits for items relating to back pain. Do you think all of those sites are reputable? No, probably not. The rest of this information here I got from the National Institute of Health website. A couple things I want to point out. Look at this one here. Eight out of ten people at some point in their life have back pain. That's a lot, isn't it? Fortunately, most of those people have an onset of back pain, they do their rest and medications and so forth, and it goes away. Okay, if that was the case for you, you probably wouldn't be here tonight, right? This one here, back pain is the second most common neurological ailment, and that means pertaining to the nervous system. And it's second to only a common headache. So it's a very common problem. But as you see tonight, as you're going to learn tonight, that it's different for everybody. We can't have a one-size-fits-all treatment approach. So we're going to start off talking about some of the basic structure and function of the back. The back is made up of, of many different structures, and they all have to be working together. And if they don't, how many of you have ended up in that position before? Okay. So you're going to see tonight how all of these structures tie in to lead to back pain. So let's start with the bone structure. The entire spine, from the base of your skull all the way down to the tailbone, is made up of individual vertebrae. And we can classify those vertebrae based on the region. So we have seven in the neck, 12 in the mid-back, and then five vertebrae in the lumbar spine. Is anybody here just for neck pain? Good, okay, because we're gonna be focusing our attention on the low back, on the lumbar spine. If you look at that picture, do you think the artist screwed it up? Do you think he didn't have his ruler that day when he was drawing this picture and he just drew it crooked? What do you think? No, of course not. The spine has some normal curves in it. This is the way the spine is supposed to be stacked upon itself. In the lumbar spine, in the low back, we have what's called a lordosis. We also see the same thing in the neck. In the mid-back, we have a, what's called a kyphosis. That's the outward curve. Okay. What do we call the curvature to the side? Anybody? Curvature of the side, to the side of the spine? Scoliosis, thank you very much. So the basic function of the bone structure is to support, also to protect, protect what? Well, protect the nerves, nervous system, and also for muscle attachment for movement. How many of you have played the game Jenga? How do you start out the game Jenga? How do you start it out? What do you have to do to get it ready to play? You have to stack it just right, don't you? Okay. And when those blocks are stacked appropriately, it's a pretty stable tower, isn't it? So just like your spine, if it's stacked the way it's supposed to be, that's when it moves its best. Okay? That's when it works its best. But what happens with the game? You start removing things, and what happens to the stack? It starts to topple over. So let's look specifically at, a, at a one vertebrae. We're going to look at the fifth vertebrae. And we're going to take it out of the entire spine, and we're going to look at it from the top down. So this is the front of your body. This is the back of your body. There's a couple areas that I want to point out because we're going to be referring to them later. 
This large area here called the body, that is where the disc uh, sets on top of the vertebrae and then another vertebrae on top of it. This large opening here is for the spinal cord as it comes down from the brain. And then these areas here on each side, you almost see a white patch. At each level of the vertebrae, all the way up and down the spine, on each side, you have a joint. So where one vertebrae stacks upon another, you have a joint, not unlike a knee joint or a finger joint, okay? And what do we know, what happens to joints as we get older? Arthritis, right? So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the arthritis that can occur in those joints. The interferdebral disc, um, we're not gonna go into detail on that right now. We're gonna talk more about its structure and function when we start to talk about common injuries. But basically it's your shock absorber. And it's gonna improve mobility of the spine as well. Nervous system. So it starts with the spinal cord that comes off of the brain. The spinal cord, interestingly enough, stops around lumbar vertebrae number two. But off of the spinal cord, we have these spaghetti looking things. Sorry for my food references tonight. I hope you guys are hungry. You, you said you were gonna bring food. So you see these little spaghetti looking things as they come out each side all the way down? Those are nerve roots. They branch off of the spinal cord itself. Those nerve roots in the lumbar spine come together and go down into the periphery, into the leg. We call that a peripheral nerve. What's the main nerve that you, everybody knows about? Sciatic nerve, okay? So those nerve roots come together and go down into the leg. How many of you have been diagnosed with sciatica? Do you wanna know the medical definition of sciatica? Condition of the sciatic nerve. <laughs> Clears it up, doesn't it, right? Know exactly what's going on. Is it because there's compression of the spinal cord? Maybe. Is it because the nerve root as it as exits the spine is being compressed? Maybe. Is it because there's a muscle in here that sometimes can compress or impinge on that nerve root? Maybe. So you're starting to see how just because you're diagnosed with sciatica, just like the person next to you, does not necessarily mean that you're gonna get the same treatment or that the same thing is gonna be effective for managing your symptoms. Okay. What is the function of the nervous system? To transmit messages. What messages might those be? There you go. My record is still unbroken. That's the first answer that everybody gives. But what about movement, sensation, vibration, temperature? Any message that goes to and from the brain is transmitted through the nervous system. Moving on to muscles and ligaments. Now if we look at this picture here, you see some white bands. You see a lot down here by the, by the pelvis. You see some between the vertebrae, one that extends all the way along. What do you think that is? What do you think those white structures are? Ligaments, exactly. Ligaments connect bone to bone and they provide the most stability. They keep things from moving around too much. They don't contract and relax like a muscle does. What about these little licorice looking things here? What do you think those are? Muscles? Those are too puny to be muscles. No, they are. Those are muscles, okay? So we have little muscles that go from one vertebrae to the next. They help to control that fine movement between each vertebrae, okay? We don't hinge open and close like a door, right? We rotate and bend and side bend, okay, a lot of different movements. And so those vertebrae have to move on top of each other. And so those muscles help with that movement. And then we have the larger muscles here. So those smaller muscles, those deeper muscles, we can consider stabilize or support the spine. Then we have those larger muscles that look like they can actually move something, they're, they're, they're bigger, um, that actually move the trunk. says, uh-uh-uh, you weren't lifting with your legs, were you? If only the problem was that obvious. <laughs> so now we're gonna start to move away from basic structure and function and start to talk about some common 
injuries that lead to, to back pain. And our focus is going to be on injuries that stem from the, the disc. And remember earlier I, I promised I would talk a little bit more about the structure and function of the disc, so this is where we're going we're to talk about that. Remember you have one vertebrae that sits upon another. In the middle is your, your, your disc. So let's take that disc out. We'll, we'll look at it from the top down. Two main structures in the disc. We have the annulus, which are very strong rings of cartilage type material, almost like rings of a tree. And in the middle, we have a soft center, okay, kind of like a jelly donut. I told you, if you're hungry, it's not the place to be. So very strong rings around that help to contain that gel center. Now when we move, how does that disc help with our movement? You can see as you bend forward, so this is the front of your body, this is your back. As you bend forward, it starts to kind of push that backwards. As you bend backwards, it kind of pushes that gel forward. How many of you like s'mores? So I have my intervertebral marshmallow. And we're going to put it between the vertebrae, our graham crackers. And as you stand up, as, as gravity acts on you, it absorbs that shock, right? And it should decompress and go right back up. As you bend forward, as you bend backwards, okay, I need to get some new marshmallows. But can you see how that allows for good mobility and shock absorption, right? So well, let's start off talking about disc degeneration. Has anybody been diagnosed with disc degeneration? Yes, okay. Again, I want to go back to the medical definition of degeneration. It is the gradual deterioration of specific tissues, cells, or organs, which what the disc is, with, and that's a very important word there, with corresponding loss of function. Okay? So it's not bad enough that the disc is starting to wear away, but now it can't do the job that it's supposed to do help with mobility, absorb shock. So these are actual cadaver discs. On the left, that is a healthy inter intervertebral disc. It looks healthy, doesn't it? You can kind of see the rings of the annulus. The center looks kind of soft, like a jelly donut. Okay. Well, if that's the jelly donut, that one is my favorite on the right, the apple fritter. Okay. So you have your jelly donut and your apple fritter. That is an example of a degenerative disc. So you can see it's kind of, it, it looks hardened. It's, it's worn away. You can't differentiate the annulus from the nucleus. Okay. So what? You've been diagnosed with disc degeneration. What happens then? Okay. So now that's what we're going to kind of talk about. So we know it's an aging process. We know that some of us wear away sooner than others. We lose normal mechanics of that disc, but then two things occur from that. And this is what we're going to talk about now. Arthritis and stenosis as a result of disc degeneration. So, you have a quiz. Number one, arthritis is the same for everyone. What do you think? False. There are over 100 different types of arthritis. Next question. Only old people get arthritis. False. That is correct. Men and women of all ages, even children, uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis is a type of arthritis. This also gets everybody. Look at this. It's not just old people. Aging process begins in the late 20s to early 30s. So we grow up, we get strong, we're healthy, and then it's all downhill from there. <laughs> Some of us a little sooner than others. <laughs> I know, it sounds like a lot of doom and gloom, doesn't it? Next question. If you have arthritis, you must have pain. Oh, not so sure on that one. That is false. It depends on your specific type of arthritis, where it is, how far it's progressed. Okay. When were most of you diagnosed and the doctor said, oh, you have arthritis? What did the doctor order? that told them that? X-ray, exactly. Well, why did you take the X-ray? Why did he order the X-ray? Pain. 
you think maybe if we, they took an x-ray before you had pain that they'd probably still see th some arthritis? Absolutely. Absolutely. Next question. Exercise is one of the best treatments for arthritis. Oh. Didn't get that past you guys. I'm going to do this. Proper exercise. So if exercise was one of the best forms of treatment, I should just send all of you home to do sit-ups, right? Matt said to do exercise, sit-ups is exercise, therefore I should go home and do 100 sit-ups every day. No, absolutely not. But we do know that staying active, staying mobile, is good for your joints, specifically when we're talking about osteoarthritis. Okay? So staying moving on a walking program, water aerobics, those types of things are great ways to do exercise with less stress on your joints. So like I said, we're going to talk about one specific form of arthritis, and that's osteoarthritis. If we look in the word, we can get our definition. What does the root word osteo stand for? Bone. Arthron. That's joint. Okay. And then what about itis? Inflammation. So there's our definition right there in the word. Okay. Inflammation of the joint due to wearing away of the cartilage that covers the bone. Okay. Uh, in the spine, we call that spondylosis. And we're talking specifically about those joints that I referred to earlier. On each side of each vertebrae, all the way up and down the spine are these joints. Okay, it's where movement occurs, right here. Interestingly, when the disc degenerates and it's not doing the job that it's supposed to do, guess where a lot of the stress of movement goes to? To the joints. Increased stress to a joint leads to arthritis, arthritis advances, and it can lead to pain. Knee replacements, where is he? There he is, there's my knee replacement patient. Back on the golf course in four weeks. We're gonna use this as an example. We're going to look at a knee to kind of explain what's going on at those joints. So if we have the thigh bone and the shin bone where they meet as the joint, you can see the white material there. That is a very specific type of cartilage that covers the ends of bones at the joint. It doesn't have any blood supply to it, doesn't have any nerve supply to it. it allows for pain-free, smooth movement between the bones. What you can see is that wears away over time What's underneath that? Bone, right. And guess what bone has? A lot of nerve supply, pain, and a lot of blood supply, inflammation. So when this arthritis, osteoarthritis, advances enough in the spine and starts to irritate and wear away that cartilage, it can start to create some pain and inflammation. So that's arthritis as a result of disc degeneration. Now we can move on to stenosis, which is another byproduct that can occur from disc degeneration. Stenosis basically means narrowing. And we can have this narrowing occurring in two different places. We can have, remember the, the opening where the spinal cord goes through in the vertebrae? That can actually get narrowed. Or remember my spaghetti noodles, those nerve roots? The opening where those exit can get narrowed as well. So we have compression on the spinal cord or on the nerve root itself. So here's our pictures of those. Up here is our foraminal stenosis. So you can see that opening there. There's our disc. There's the joint. Our nerve root exits right between there. And as the disc degenerates, things collapse. Uh, you get increase in arthritis in the joints and it can start to compress on the nerve root. In spinal stenosis, remember this large opening the way it was supposed to be? Well, you can be born with a smaller opening, which means you could be more prone to spinal stenosis or even degenerative and it narrows up the opening where the spinal cord goes through. Okay. Symptoms. Typically, this is a long, drawn-out process where this is going to occur. You've been, probably been having some pain for a while, and it's progressing, and now it's starting to lead to symptoms that may actually go down into your leg. 
because when we start to compress on that nerve, where does the nerve go? In the lumbar spine, it goes down to the leg, right? And that's where we might get numbness, tingling, shooting type pains that go down in the leg. To go on a little tangent here for a second, I encourage you to be good historians of your symptoms. Do you know what that means? Keep track of them, okay? What do they feel like? Where does it go, okay? Uh, is it a sharp stabbing pain versus an ache? Is it numbness? Is it tingling? What part of the leg might it be in? Because that can tell the doctor what nerve is being uh, compressed. Okay? What time of the day is it better or worse? What movements or positions or activities make it better or worse? All of that information tells us something. Okay? So be good historians of your symptoms. Typically, with a stenosis patient, symptoms are down the leg are going to be worse when you are walking or standing upright. Why? When you stand up or even go backwards, the hole gets smaller. And so it can compress on that nerve root even more. When you bend forward slightly and your symptoms go away in your leg, well, you can see how that hole is opening up there and it's freeing up some space and it's not compressing the nerve root. I forgot to show you my degenerative marshmallow. Nice and burned, just the way I like them. Okay, so remember if with a degenerative disc, it's not doing its job. So if I put that same amount of force through my degenerative disc, what's going to happen? Squish. Okay, and it collapses. Doesn't allow for very much mobility, does it? And if there's enough force going through there, it can even lead to vertebral fractures, oftentimes. Okay, so there's my degenerative marshmallow for you. Okay, we're going to move away from disc degeneration, and we're going to stay with the disc, but we're going to talk about herniated disc. I'm sure you guys have heard about herniated disc. Disc bulges, um, that's what we're going to talk about now. Herniated disc typically occurs in a younger population. Why do you think that that would be? More active, that's one. More strenuous activity, yes. From what you've learned so far tonight, looking at the disc, why would we see more disc herniations, which means that gel material is starting to make its way through the injury, through the tears? Why do you think that usually occurs in a younger population from what we've learned tonight? Yes, remember in a degenerative disc, was that gel material nice and soft and gooey, or was it hard and crusty? Okay, so as you get older, that gel material can't be uh, protruded as much, because it's hardened. So typically we're going to see this in the uh, you know, 20s to maybe late 50s, early 60s. And typically, with a herniated disc, it's going to be associated with trauma. But we need to be very careful on how we define trauma. When you think of trauma, you think of somebody bending over wrong and picking up something very heavy and their back goes out. They know what happened. They know when they hurt themselves and they can point to exactly the cause of things. Okay? But a lot of times that doesn't happen with patients. They simply wake up one morning and they can't get out of bed. Right? So we need to talk about not only the, uh, the owl moment, the injury, but we need to talk about another type of trauma. There was a study done uh, quite a while ago that wanted to look at the amount of force that was occurring through the, the low back, the disc in the low back. So they found a guinea pig that weighed 70 kilograms or 154 pounds. They fed a wire down into the disc and they wanted to measure how much force. And they had him uh, assume these different positions to measure. Well, it makes sense if you're lying down, maybe your feet up on a bolster or, or over a pillow or even a recliner, the amount of force in that disc is fairly low, right? If we go to the other extreme, if you're bending over and picking up something very heavy, you can see how the forces would be fairly high, over three times body weight of force through that disc. What are all of us doing right now? What are all of you doing right now? What do most Americans do for a living? sit. And how do they get to the place where they're going to sit? They drive and sit some more, right? So look at the forces here. Sitting 
with your back against the chair in a fairly good posture is over two times body weight of force through that disc. Sitting in a slouch posture, again, approaching what this one is. So yes, we have a injury, but we can also have repetitive trauma. If you took your finger and you bent your finger back and you held it like that all day long, think after a while it's probably going to hurt? Absolutely. Okay, so we can have a, a buildup of, of injury to that disc that can um, lead to pain. Okay, that's why we're going to talk later tonight about the importance of, of body mechanics and posture. So as you see here back on this picture, uh, when there's injury to the disc, remember when you bend forward, where does that gel material go? Backwards. Again, if we're sitting and we're bending and everything that we're doing is forward and it's constantly putting pressure on that disc in the back, eventually it can lead to tears in that annulus, which contains that nucleus, and you can start to get your bulge. With a herniated disc, you can also have symptoms down your leg. If that disc bulge is going to protrude backwards, look what's right behind that bulge. What is that? The nerve root. Exactly. So a lot like the stenosis, if you have pressure on that nerve root with a herniated disc, it can send symptoms down the leg. And remember in the beginning I told you that there's a lot of other structures that are involved in the, in the back? Well, when you have an injury to the disc, it's not just the disc we need to worry about. When you have an acute injury, what do your muscles do? They go into spasm, don't they? They tighten up. They tell you to stop moving, you're gonna hurt yourself more. Be still. So we gotta deal with muscle spasms. When you're hurting, do you move the way, do you move normally, naturally, the way you normally move? No, you change how you move because you're in pain, you're hurting. Okay? You may be shifted over a little bit from a disc bulge. Okay? Or limping if you're having symptoms down the leg. Again, looking at another study that's a little more recent showed that if you change your movement patterns, consistently over a period of four to six weeks, guess what? Your brain repatterns that as your normal movement. Okay? So as time goes by, yes, your muscle spasms may be gone away. Yes, your disc herniation may have healed because it has that potential, but you're still not moving the way that you're supposed to. And it may be causing continued strain to the back. If the disc isn't doing its job, remember we talked about more stress on the joints, which can lead to early arthritis, and then stenosis we already talked about before when the disc bulge actually starts to push on the nerve root. Most of the pain that we're dealing with in the clinic has to do with issues related to the disc. Okay, moving on to some common tests. Um, X-ray is just gonna look at, at bone structure. Unless there's been some sort of an injury, an accident, they may not even do it right away. But the x-ray is going to look at bone structure. So possible fractures, dislocations, infection, tumors, scoliosis, curvature of the spine. But wait a second. Disc disease. If a disc isn't a bone, right, how can an x-ray diagnose something going on with a disc? Let's go back to our marshmallows. So remember our vertebrae in between here? Can you see a difference between the two? The distance between the vertebrae? So if they see that those vertebrae have kind of collapsed or closer together, they can assume that there's an amount of disc degeneration going on in there. Okay. One of the other tests that they might uh, have you do is an MRI, but there are specific indications for an MRI. The doctor's not going to just right away do an MRI for you. Typically, they'll do an MRI if they see some other red flags and they think something else might be going on and it's not just a true back condition. If you're having nerve symptoms for a prolonged period of time, they might consider it or if they're considering surgery. Because look here, go on WebMD. You can go on it yourself and you can look that up that says MRIs provide no helpful early information about your condition. Just like with arthritis and x-rays, you can have disc bulges, and things going on that you see on an, on an MRI, but that may not necessarily be the cause of your symptoms. Okay. Has anybody had a nerve conduction study? Yes? Was it fun? <laughs> yeah. So in a nerve conduction study, remember nerves transmit messages, right? 
And if they want to see if there's somewhere along that path that those messages are being blocked because of compression of the, of the nerve, they'll put a probe at one end and a probe at the other, send a shock down the leg or down the arm, and they'll measure how quickly it takes to get from one point to the other. Okay? And they can compare that to some normal values. Uh, the EMG, if they think there might be some neurological condition going on with the muscles them themselves, which are leading to weakness and so forth, they might do an EMG study as well. And those are just some of the more common tests. There are other ones out there. It says, hey, my lower back pain, it's gone. You get it? Acupuncture. Okay. So now we're going to start to talk about some pain and some common treatments. We're not going to get into a lot of detail tonight about treatments. Why? It's person-specific, and there's a lot of them, okay? Every patient responds a little bit differently to, to your condition, okay? But all of these are very valid treatments for low back pain. Uh, a lot of times medications get a bad rap. Well, I don't want to take those medications. I don't want to get addicted. Okay? But what if those pain medications are allowing you to move the way you need to move to get stronger or to exercise or to go on a walking program? Because we know that mobility is good for you. If we look at other treatment approaches on this list, uh, we see things that you're more familiar with, like physical therapy and chiropractic. And some of you may have also been to pain management, uh, where they can do injections, including epidurals or facet injections, which are injections into the joints that we talked about earlier. And the pain management specialist can also help manage your medications. Uh, massage therapy can also be helpful, especially during those acute flare-ups to help manage any muscle spasm. Even things over here on this side, when do you feel like your pain is always at its highest? Is there a certain time of the day when you notice that your pain is just really bothering you the most? How about when you're going to bed yeah. at night? Okay, You're trying to settle down, you're in bed, there's no distractions going on. You don't have anything else to distract you from your pain. Okay? There's actually a, a phenomenon called the gate theory. Um, if, if I bump my hand, What's my first reaction? Ouch. Right? Rub it. Pain goes away or lessens. It's because the, the nerves for sensation are actually larger and faster than the nerves for pain. So I stimulate those nerves for sensation, those messages get up to my brain and kind of block or shut the gate for the messages of pain. So there are some things that you can do to help manage your symptoms. Even keeping a positive attitude or outlook on your condition, which I know can be difficult to do when you're having to deal with pain, uh, but the brain is a powerful tool. So your self-talk or how you perceive your situation can actually help manage your symptoms. Uh, we also have meditation and relaxation techniques, even humor. You recall the old saying, right? Laughter is the best medicine. And lastly, we have appropriate exercise, uh, like what we talked about earlier. We don't want to just exercise, we want you to exercise in a way that is appropriate for you. And in future presentations or in your visits to physical therapy, um, you will learn those techniques and ways to exercise that are appropriate for you. And I encourage you to find your own recipe. Okay. So it takes time, it takes consistency, all right? But you need to find your recipe that works well for you. And hopefully as you go th from here tonight, that's when you go to your doctor, to your physical therapist, your own research online and you help to find that recipe that works well for you.